Hello and welcome to another episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. Today I shall be attempting to do a restoration on this Scammell 6x6 Pickford's tractor. It's a Matchbox Major Pack 6A and they were built in 1960. This is one of the earlier ones in the darker red colour. It was a 200 tonne transporter which is an amazing thing. This model's seen better days, it's missing its front bogey. Uh, thankfully I've got a second one that I can use. The decals are missing, scratched off, the paintwork is atrocious, it's obviously been well played with. But I'm hoping to make this look brand new again. This model was actually in box number 14, which came from Henry James Kasuli from Winchmore in North London. So thanks Henry, without you this video would not be possible. It's been in a box of cars for quite a a while now so I thought it was time to give it a shot my decals have arrived which I ordered online now I don't know whether it was Henry the person that donated this or somebody else but the base has already been removed and in drilling out the rivet they went off center a little bit there and nearly broke through the wall so I'm glad they stopped when they did here you can see the general color of this model is dark blue and a very dark red the later models came out with a brighter colour. It says they're Crane 200 tonne transport. I don't know what the Crane means unless that was the brand of the manufacturer of the trailer. Here's the front bogey that I said I had spare. This has been floating around in a box, completely separate with no wheels. And it's also got the front attachment points for the tow hook broken off. So it's got to fit on there. I've also got to make a, a small wire draw bar at some stage. Here's a close-up of the damaged, broken off items that I'm going to have to try and repair. It's going to be tricky and challenging. I've done it. I haven't done it many times, but I have done it before. But it's always touch and go. Now the front bogey actually swivels on this pivot point. Now it's a good tight fit. As it is, I'm hoping with an extra couple of coats of paint, I won't have to attach it in any way other than just a force fit, as is probably what was occurring in the factory at the time. Because obviously I can't drill through that and put a screw in because it's just too shallow. The rear bogey is fixed and does not pivot due to the addition of an extra pin in a second hole. It's also slightly different shaped on the rear end. So what I'm hoping to do is instead of drilling out that rivet, I'm just going to force this apart and then similar to what I intend to do with the front end is after I've painted it, I'm going to force it back together. And because it's a display model, it's not going to be played with. It should sit quite well together on the shelf and should be able to be handled and it, it probably won't fall apart. But I cannot guarantee that in the future some kid might play with this and it will fall to bits but that's not my concern at the moment i just want it to look like a really good model and that's the best idea i could come up with simple solution for a simple model from a simple minded person that's me so there you go i just tried pushing it back on again like I said, with a couple of coats, undercoat and a top coat, that's going to be slightly tighter fit. So I'm hopeful it's going to work. First up, I've got to remove these wheels off of the rear bogey. I use this cylindrical grinding stone. You can see I've worn the shoulders off of the one on the left. The one on the right is what it should look like, a newer one. So I'm going to have a go at dressing or repairing, if you will, reshaping the worn one using my grindstone in my shed. I was going to go on the end there, but I think instead I'll go in the side of the grindstone. Not best practice, I know. But I'm just experimenting here to see whether or not this is possible. Because if it is, then I can save some money by reusing this stone over and over and over again and just repairing it by grinding it down a little bit of the time when required. And indeed it worked really well. Uh, the one on the left you would not believe was the older one of the two. 
So I'm very pleased that I've now got a spare in stock. These cylindrical grindstones fitted into a small dremel make removing the axles a breeze. You just wear away that wider collar on the end and they just fall apart like that. Minimum amount of effort involved. Sometimes the tyres are difficult to get off, today they're not. I don't think I've worked on a model with so many wheels as this one. It's actually got 18 wheels in total. Before I strip the paint, I always like to try and match it because once it's gone, it's gone and it's a best practice to do it before you remove the paint. Now that russet I thought was a close match, so I got this little earth truck that I did the other week and I painted it in the raw paint and obviously it's the wrong colour. So I'm going to have to add some black to this russet red to make it that rather dark burgundy that I'm after. As always, Matchbox never accurately really match their paints and there's always variations. Because of this, I'm quite confident that I can use this blue paint, the Mr. Hobby blue paint there, straight out of the bottle. Here you can see there's a comparison, there's two different colored blues. So I'm gonna just use the US Navy Blue Angels Blue 328 out of the bottle. It's quite a dark blue and it's quite a close match. And really with matchbox cars, you, near enough is good enough. I'm sure you've seen plenty of these restoration videos in the past and have realized as I have that the colors do vary depending on the year that they were manufactured, probably due to different batch numbers of paint. The russet, however, with the addition of the black is a very, very close match to this original color. So with the paint pre-mixed, I now like to seal these little pot pots until it's time for me to use them. I've run out of snap lock lids, which I have been using. So today I'm using a finger off of a rubber glove I've cut and just stretch it over the end tightly to make an airtight seal. Now ordinarily I would use a little piece of wide tape uh, I was running low and Julie happened to find some in a shop she was in the other day and she bought me a pack of four and I thought, oh great, I was running short on this stuff. It's cartel speed tape or fabric tape. At, uh, it, wasn't, I, I, it didn't take me long to realize that this tape is absolutely useless. It does not stick to anything. Not like sticky tape should anyway. It's like there's no gum on it or very 1% of gum. It won't even stick to itself. Watch this. Ready? It's not sticky at all. It's not sticky. It's not sticky. <laughs> I think you get the idea, it's going straight in the bin. I have been watching the El Chapo documentary on Netflix. He's a drug lord, if you remember, and he packs his drugs up with tape like this. So I did wonder if that's why they call it cartel tape. Anyway, if he'd used this, whoever bought it, he'd probably be dead, because it doesn't stick. Anyway, I'm stripping the paint. Today I'm not using paint stripper, I'm gonna try out my sandblaster again. The first time I used glass beads, as a blasting media. The second time I used garnet dust. This time I'm using a combination of 50-50 garnet dust and glass beads. Just to see if it makes a difference. I know there's loads of different types of blasting media out there and I'm still experimenting. I do actually believe that I need to upgrade my compressor at some stage because it seems to run constantly and they're not supposed to run constantly. 
it struggles to keep up the pressure at 100 psi anyway here goes second time i've used this sandblaster to clean the paint off of a matchbox vehicle i have used it to do some old sheep shearing shears try saying that when you've had a few to drink and they came up pretty good i also did a a huge shifting spanner adjustable spanner that i had in the shed and that worked well i'm not too sure it's suited for the matchbox cars though what do you think on the face of it it looks like it's making short work of it but it actually takes 10 times as long doing it this way as it does using the paint stripper not only that the paint stripper gets 100% of the paint off more often than not with this sandblasting technique looking through the frosted glass window it's difficult to gauge how well you've done and it's only afterwards when you shut down and bring the stuff inside under good light and high magnification that you can see that the sandblaster has actually left some of the original paint on the model. It's also altered the surface finish of this metal. It's given it a kind of, um, well, very minor pitting all over, I guess you could say, making it look dull. And not too sure it's the best option, as I said before. I'm going to look for some other stuff, like maybe walnut shells, and see if that does a better job. But in the meantime, I'm sticking with this because it's done now. Now I'm looking at these broken lugs off the front there. And in my mind's eye, this is what I want to create. I've looked at pictures online and I know what they're supposed to look like. And second time around, I'm going to try and use this solder and my little gas burner there with plenty of flux. And I've got the base off of a an old Mercedes 230 SL and I'm using this metal cut it off in chunks and use it to repair models because it's the same type of pot metal now, the shears don't do a very good job of cutting it they make quick work of it but I have to grind the edges down and make it look nice and square before I can attempt to solder this thing back together so I use a variety of small hobby files and keep checking and adjusting as I go I'm trying to match exactly the size of the original part that's missing. So I've left a very thin nub of the original lug there on the bogey assembly for me to try and match. Still slightly oversized. I keep going until I'm as close as I feel I can get to the correct size. You can see I've used these wooden vice clamps before doing a similar thing because they're all charred on the end. The reason I use the wooden vice clamps is because they don't allow the part that you're heating to cool rapidly. If you use the metal clamps, obviously they suck the heat out of the part. And I'm also using these soldering helping hands, which I usually use for holding my camera at close quarters for close-up shots but today I'm using it today I'm using them for the purpose that they were intended and that is to hold small parts together whilst you're soldering not a very good picture of the flux that I'm using here it came with a product called muggy world but I actually find it's quite good for use with other solder rather than the, just the muggy world bars now the theory is wherever you paint the flux the melted solder will migrate to those parts so let's see if it works I'm very careful not to apply too much heat I have actually melted models in the past and they literally vanish before your eyes before you have time to react they just shrivel up and die 
Now that's pretty good for a first attempt. I want to get some around this side too, so the world is completely on all sides, and it kind of floods around the front there. Now I've got this big bulbous lump of solder to work on to try and make it look like the original part again. And so I've given myself extra work there. Here's the Duratec solder I'm using. 60, oh, I, won't, I won't go on about the percentages. Anyway, that's one done, and it seems uh, I do let it cool before I pick it up. I've been caught out in the past like that. Let it cool before you touch it, because it's damned hot. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. And I'll go ahead and do the second one. And the same deal. I left too much solder on there. A bit of a chore, but I do take my time, file away, and take it back down to the level to which it's supposed to be. And now, after I've done that, I very cautiously use this circular cutting saw on my Dremel and just shape, roughly shape the lugs so I can work on them with some files and create this. Now, I want to see what this looks like with an undercoat on it. I can't wait. I think the undercoat will hide the score marks from the file and uh, I'm hopeful that it's going to look like an original piece. I'm very, very pleased with how these turned out. And it doesn't cost much for a little soldering iron and some solder. So if you're into this hobby, give it a go. Anyway, time to undercoat this part. Okay, have a look at that. I'm very, very pleased, except for that little bit of hair on the, uh, in the hole of the lug. I picked that out with a pin. And overall, I'm giving myself a pat on the back because this was a tiny little fix and it was the major, major th problem with this model. So I think it's fair to say that I've overcome that obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, I've got to drill and tap this hole. That was a bit of a struggle also, trying to re-centralize that hole in the post. So what I did, I drilled in on a 45 degree angle initially, and then I could center the drill and, and drill down vertically into the new hole. I've tapped it and these little M2 button headed screws go in there quite well. This one's one of the longer ones I've got, the four millimeter in length. And again, another win. So this thing's looking good. So after paint stripping and uh, undercoating, this is what I'm left with. I've also painted the base of the truck, the prime mover, the tractor, with some satin black paint which is a common thing I do these days. I do like the finish of the satin black. And good news is that the primer has fairly well concealed the pitting. Although if you look really, really close under high magnification, you can still see it's not perfect. But then again, was the original casting ever perfect? I probably doubt it. So at this magnification, of course, everything looks rougher than it is in real life. But as I say, overall I'm pleased and I'm looking forward to painting these models, putting them back together and assembling this huge little major pack model back to what it should look like. A few features here. On the rear there's a moulded a spare tyre in there. Uh, the grill is very ordinary. It's almost like this was the end of the run for that casting mold because the details just aren't there like I've seen in other matchbox models. It's a twin cab, you can see there's two sets of doors there and steps for the the riggers to get in and out. Fuel cap, um, those things on the back, I don't really know what they are, they look at, they're offset, they could be hydraulic rams, not sure. Uh, anyone that, who knows, please let me know, I'm always curious to learn about these things. So, oh, time to paint. Put on the old fan. It's lasted well, that fan. I think it was like 10 bucks from a hardware store. Uh, probably due replacement soon, because it is getting a little bit rattly. I think some of the overspray gets into it and stuffs up the electric motor to a degree. This thing's running at maybe 50% capacity. 
Probably burst into flames one day. Hope not, but you never know. I do have a fire extinguisher in my hobby room anyway. All these flammable paints and thinners, I think it's worth having if you're into this hobby. Get yourself a cheap little chemical dry powder fire extinguisher and keep it on standby. Right, next thing that's missing is the drawbar from the front of the front steerable swiveling bogey set. So I'm going to make that out of this one millimeter width diameter. I don't know what gauge that would be, wire. Fairly rigid wire, this. And this little component probably took me an hour to make. <laughs> I know, it looks simple enough, but you try bending a piece of wire and making it look as neat as possible. And you soon realize that bending wire is quite an art. Obviously Matchbox had a machine to do it, but I'm using my fingers and pliers. And it's quite tricky. Also using some images offline to try and get the dimensions and shape correct. Right, wheels. I've got all the wheels I need except for six. <laughs> so I guess you could say I don't have all the wheels I need. There's 12, I need another six. And I need them to match, I, I fear. It just so happens that I have a big collection of wheels. Some of these have been donated. Some of them I've robbed off of other models in the past. Some of them I've found wrapped around loose in packages that have been sent to me. And I just collect them all because you never, never know when you're going to need them. Now, this was very quite interesting because I was able to find six and only six of these wheels. So I'm guessing in the past, someone has taken the wheels off of one of these trucks and then they sent me the, the wheels in a, in a parcel of wheels or something. I don't know. I don't know where they came from, but thankfully I've got them. Uh, two of them got stubs of axles in, so I'm using my axle separation system once again. It's a great little thing to have. If you haven't got one, make one. Look at that. Simple easy clean axle removal I love it now I got these um, axle pins are a bit rusty so I've got to find three more for the prime mover uh, not only have I got a box of wheels I've got a box of axles as well and it's always a bit of a struggle finding these because they all look the same and then you pick them up and they're all different the heads are different sizes the lengths are different sizes the diameter of the the axle is sometimes different sizes. And again, the clock is ticking, another half hour goes by and I find three axles to match. This is why this hobby takes me so long. I don't know how other people manage to put out a video a day. It is so time consuming, the simplest thing can take half a day. Anyway, I've got three there. They look pretty damn good as a set. First up, I'm going to clean these wheels. Now, Julie's popped out down to the shops for five minutes, so I'm seizing the opportunity just to go and grab her jewellery cleaner. She bought it, I don't know, a couple of years ago. I don't think she's actually used it. She doesn't really have much jewellery as it is, so why the hell she bought it, I don't know. Anyway, this is going to be great. I'm sure I can just chuck these grimy little tyres and wheels in here because they've got like a groove in them that's full of gunk. I'm just using some warm water and some washing up liquid. Look at that, it looks brand new, this thing. I'm just gonna run it for five minutes. See what the results are. It's so time consuming to clean 18 wheels by hand, because 18 wheels means, what, 36 sides. You gotta flip them over, scrub them with a toothbrush, each individual one. I'm just trying to make a shortcut here because there's so many tires and wheels that it would take me half a day. Look at that, the water's throbbing away there, all that sort of ultrasonic waves going through it, pulsating away. Hopefully it's uh, doing a good job of cleaning these tires and wheels. I take them out and first glance I can see they are looking 100% on what they were, so I've just got to quickly clean out this jewellery cleaner. Put it back in the ensuite before Julie gets home. But you know what? I think I've got a win there. That saved me so much time. 
So after I've cleaned them, I put some on some paper tape to hold them, stop them blowing away, and I give them a quick coat of this Tamiya TS13 clear. And they look like new wheels. They look like they've just been come out of the factory in uh, old new stock. A little bit like blackberries, don't they, with the knobbly edges? Hmm. Might have a jam sandwich for lunch. Anyway, one last thing. Rusty axles. Some of them are bent, so I've got to straighten those. I've also got to get all the rust off. Shine up the, the uh, mushroom end there. This is quick job. Near enough is good enough. Got to crack on, get this thing done. It's taken way too long. I've got this little chuck I bought on wish.com. Took about nine months to get here. Got here in the end, didn't have a power supply. So I repurposed a power supply from an old laptop I had. The wattage and amperage and voltage was all the same. So it wired straight in and it's great. It's a handy little thing. This is basically what I use it for these days. Just cleaning the axles with, in this case, the top one was clean with wire wool. The bottom one was, I used emery paper. I think the wire wool did a little slightly better job. Makes them look a little bit chromed. After I've done that, I've got to put the wheels on. So I've got here two nail punches with concave tips. Put them in my drill press. Uh, exactly aligned together and using some gentle pressure and a, a moderate speed not fast not slow the drill the chuck spinning at a moderate speed and it only needs a tiny little amount because the axles are such a close fit to the the hole in the wheel only needs a little bit now here's a tip i was trying to explain how you know when it's done because you can't see you can't physically see the end well, can you see all those little iron filings coming off? When you see the iron filings starting to shed, you're pretty much there. That's the time to stop. If you don't see the iron filings, you're wasting your time. Well, in my experience, you may have a different setup. Who knows? But that's my tip for the day. Now, I've got these rubber gloves on. I think they are child-sized. Either that or my hands are fat. But the uh, reason I've got the gloves on is because I'm going to compress these parts back together. And even though I did put these parts in the oven to bake, I don't want to risk leaving any humongous fingerprints on, on the finished item. Not so much on the cabin here, because that's minimal handling on that, on the, on, the, on the prime move of the tractor. But it's the tray here where I'm really going to be pushing down with a lot of pressure to get these things to click back together. So once again, remind myself, one end's got two spigots, the other one's got one. Obviously the two spigots go into the two holes. It's quite awkward actually to align them. I'm thinking, I hope I don't scratch the top of this blue Bogey here, wheel assembly. And it's surprisingly difficult to get it back together. You can see that you may or may not be able to detect the pressure I'm using there to try and get this back together. But finally, with extra, extra push. Oh, what a great feeling that was. When that snapped home, I knew I was onto a winner. Next up, the front one. This was slightly easier, which I'm glad, because it has to rotate freely, which it does. Um, these are some decals that I've had kicking around for a while. Now, they're from Recover Toy, Matchbox Spare Parts, where they do Dinky and Corgi also. And what I like about them is they are printed in white. Personally, I can't make white decals. And I'm very impressed with these, although I did compare the font after I did it with the original font, and it is slightly different, although this font looks looks the part. It's not a 100% accurate reproduction, but it's close. And they look good. They look damn good. 
There's so many of them though, there's six of them to put on, and each one I'm I'm scared I'm gonna wreck it. So I don't have any spares. Six is a, a fair number for me. You know, I normally only do two or one even. But six. I must admit, I was a little bit nervous at this stage because you can never let your guard down in this hobby. You can always ruin something at the very, very last minute. And it's happened to me before and I've had to strip the model back down and restart. It's so frustrating. Um, I feel sorry for anyone it's happened to. But if it's happened to you, let me know in the comments because I'd like to know if I'm not alone. Okay, there's that draw bar in place. It looks the bee's knees. So here's a reminder of what we started with. Very, very shabby. Surprised this one wasn't chucked in the dustbin before I got my mitts on it. I could see someone clearing out somebody's belongings and going, nah, that's going in the bin. Well, I'm glad that Henry James Kasuli from North London sent it to me. Thank you, Henry. I've managed to turn the clock back on this one and make a nice display piece for my cabinet that can be seen by future generations. What did I say? This bottle came out in 1960. That's two years before I was born. So this is 60 years old. Is that correct? I don't know. I'm not very good at maths. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, It's 60 years old. So, an amazing piece of English toy history here, memorabilia, and most worthy of restoration. So, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. If you have, please like, subscribe, and recommend to your friends. This piece is now going into my hobby cabinet, and there it will stay until I either move or die. So thank you so much for watching. This is Marty from Marty's Matchbox Makeovers saying goodbye.